Hello space lovers, my name is Ravi and I'm a third year aerospace engineering student from the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronauts UNSW branch. I'll be taking over for Winnie, our professional events director. And today's special guest is Professor Kim V. Tran from UNSW Physics. She's an amazing woman that has uh, been around the world conducting research in astrophysics. But uh, before we go ahead, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands of which we work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this meeting and I pay respect to elders past, present and emerging and recognize and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal people and the ongoing cultures and connection to the lands of waters of UNSW. So welcome to our first installment of the 2020, 2021 AIAA Speaker Series podcast. Uh, could you please introduce yourself, Professor Tran? Uh, hi, Rami. Thanks, first of all, for the invitation. And I also want to acknowledge the uh, first uh, Americans where I am, I'm actually ca uh, calling you from Seattle, Washington in the US where, yeah, <laughs> uh, where I spend a lot of my time as well. Um, and I'm hoping to get back to Sydney uh, as soon as uh, travel restrictions ease a little bit, but um, it's great to be here. And um, I'll give you the short version of my narrative, which is I went to school in the US and then I did postdoctoral positions in Europe um, the U.S. and then I took a faculty position in the U.S. but then there was an opportunity to join UNSW and I was very keen on that because I have a lot of collaborators in Australia who I work with on various projects and I love Australia. Um, I've you know, had been traveling there fairly regularly up until the chance to join the faculty at UNSW and so I figured it was just too good an opportunity to pass up. But in terms of my background in, in research, I've definitely been focused on research ever since I was a graduate student. I went to grad school at the University of California in Santa Cruz, uh, which is actually a really well-known astrophysics program. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. I'll mention it and people think it's a party school. I'm like, yeah, it's also known as a party school, but it's actually really uh, one of the top programs in astrophysics, um, primarily because of a long history with the observatory in California and um, now at Hawaii. And from there, I went and did research in Switzerland and um, also in the Boston area and uh, then moved on to faculty position in Texas. And then from there, uh, joined the faculty at UNSW. But my research really is using um, observatories, ground and in, in, in space, which is very relevant to um, what you guys do, mm -hmm. and uh, to look at how galaxies like our Milky Way form. And the way I do that is by looking at uh, objects that are very, very far away at different distances from us. And, um, and by the fact that light has a finite travel speed, the farther away an object is, the farther back in time I'm looking. So the younger the universe is correspondingly. And so I'm able to then hopefully gather essentially a photo album of different galaxies at different stages of their lives and um, then try to help me understand how galaxies like our Milky Way and our other neighbors like the Andromeda galaxy also form. And so I, I use powerful telescopes because the light from these objects is very faint. So I use from the ground uh, observatories like the Very Large Telescope in Chile, um, which is run as part of the European Southern Observatory and then um, Keck Observatories in Hawaii. And then of course the Hubble Space Telescope, the Spitzer Space Telescope, and hopefully very soon, the James Webb Space Telescope that should yeah. be launched later this year, which we're all very excited about and hoping that will go well. Um, so yeah, I've always been really interested in the universe and looking at galaxies because they're just beautiful. And uh, at the same time, they're, um, they contain a lot of physics that helps us understand um, physics, both on the small scale, but also to the largest scales, of course, which is the universe as a whole. Yeah, wow, that's a, you've been all over, all over the world and you've been everywhere. So thank you, thank you for the introduction. That'll give everyone a good insight to your expertise. And starting off with our first question, um, as every space enthusiast asks each other, when did you get interested in space and what made you decide that you were going to go into space as a career? So I uh, actually know I wanted to study astrophysics until I went to university. Um, my mm. background um, in, in all the way up to year 12 um, was really, I did arts, but then I also did science. So I had a very strong maths background and physics background, but I also really loved the arts. And so 
the humanities and um, dance, et cetera. And so when I went to university, I took a range of courses and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but then I took an astronomy course and that was when I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. I really want to learn more about this. And the university I went undergrad is the University of Arizona, happens to also have a very strong astrophysics program. In fact, you may know one of their alums, Brian Schmidt, who is a Nobel laureate over at ANU, also was at the University of Arizona. Uh, and oh, he's, wow. uh, yeah, he won his Nobel in, as part of the discovery of dark energy. And so I was very fortunate to be in a university that had a very strong astro um, program. And so basically from the first year after I took that astronomy course, I then uh, really focused on my physics classes and taking, taking astronomy classes. And um, I took, the more I learned, the more I realized that I wanted to do this um, really as long term. And so I learned that basically if I wanted to do this long term, I, I would need to go into a PhD program. And so that kind of just fell, it was into place in that in that sense. It was pretty clear once I decided that I wanted to study astrophysics and, and be involved in trying to really answer the big questions and study the universe that um, I you know, the next logical step would, would be to apply to go to grad school. And then from there, that's kind of how everything would, yeah. It, in in, in in progression. Ah, so even in high school, um, like early high school, you say you'd uh, like a little bit unsure what to do? Yeah, I mean, I it's, ah. it's interesting. I talked to a lot of people and some people knew from a very early age that they wanted to go into astronomy or astrophysics. Um, but honestly, I didn't know. I was interested in lots of things. I love writing. Um, I love reading uh, the classics as well as you know, science fiction and mm. um, science as a whole. But I, I really didn't know what it was that people did in, in research. Um, and it was because I had the opportunity to, to do a research experience um, mm. pretty much after my first year at university. And then I realized that um, it was just a chance to sit around and think about interesting questions and look at um, beautiful observational data, because uh, that was clearly where my my focus was going. And so um, I was like, wow, this is this is it really does combine both the quantitative aspect of my training, but then also the very creative and um, you know, artistic, I guess, part of 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 the, of the universe. Wow, it's amazing. So I guess. Um, following on from that uh, about school, like, do you think space should be taught more in the high schools and stuff? Like, why, why, or why not? So I'm not really familiar with the curriculum in um, Australia because I didn't go into that system. I do know yeah. that there is a track that is included as part of the uh, as the curriculum. So um, I can't say whether or not this should be more or less. I definitely think it should be included, and I definitely think that. Um, in the same way that there are certain topics everybody's interested in, astronomy mm -hmm. and the universe is something that everybody's interested, doesn't matter how old you are. And so I think using that as a, as a, as a way to keep, get people to um, you know, ask big questions and be curious about the, the universe is, is always a good thing. And so I do think that um, if you can incorporate that so that people have understand that as a science, it's, it's both beautiful and intriguing and interesting. And yes, there's maths involved, but that's mm. not just the only thing. Um, and so it, it really should be something that everybody is engaged in, is, is asking the questions and thinking about the universe. So um, I would just say that it's, I would, I would hope that it's taught for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, I think it really kind of depends on the types of, uh, you know, direction that students want to go into. Um, so, for example, I have worked with high school students in, in sort of work experience, and I, I think that that's been really a, a great opportunity for them, as well as my team. And so they'll come at, in year 11, and then they'll learn a little bit more about what we do. And so that's been really a great way to get you know, a better sense of, of, of what day-to-day -day, um, research is like in astronomy. But in terms of a curriculum, I think just in, in particular with Australia having such a rich history of indigenous astronomy and indigenous knowledge about the physical mm. sciences, I think having that um, as part of the wider curriculum is, is really important. Mm. 
Ah. So going more into your the nitty gritty, your, your research is focused on cosmic time by using big telescopes to get to observe the building blocks of our galaxies. What are some things you look for which allows us to understand more about our universe? So I would say there are a few key parameters, I, I guess you would call them, that I really try to key in on, which is um, trying to track how galaxies build up their chemicals and how galaxies grow in terms of mass. And so this is, when I say chemicals, I mean the astronomer's periodic table. It's just this running joke. Basically, everything heavier than helium is considered, we consider it a metal. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah, so basically, when we talk about chemicals or metal enrichment, we're basically talking about anything that's not hydrogen or helium, because hydrogen and helium make up the bulk of the universe, and so everything mm. else, for the most part, had to be made in the cores of stars. And so um, what we try to do, or what I try to do, is track how this interplay between galaxies converting that primordial gas, which really is you know, about 75% hydrogen and 24-ish percent helium and 1% of lithium. And that's about a tiny little bit of some other stuff, but everything, that's what we call this primordial gas. And then how you take that primordial gas and then um, form stars and in the, in the, um, in stars through fusion, you can make these heavier elements, basically all the stuff that you and I are made out of. Um, and then watch how that happens over time because it's, it's the, the metals, metals that we have around us today didn't form right when the universe formed. It actually took uh, multiple generations of stars. And so when a star mm -hmm. dies, sometimes it will explode. And, and so that it spills its guts into the interstellar medium. And then that essentially pollutes or enriches, depends on your perspective, <laughs> the gas. And so then that gas, when it forms the next generation of stars has some metals in it. And so progressively you can have um, more and more metals in stars. And then that's the material that you need to form things like planets, right? So like not just Earth, but also Jupiter's and uh, essentially all the extrasolar planets we, we see. And what I do is I try to track this growth by looking at galaxies. And so um, I can measure what we call the abundances of, of by looking at certain structural features as you go to higher and higher redshifts. So that's, in, that's one aspect, which is trying to understand essentially how the oxygen we breathe when, when most of it was formed and, and um, was it early on, was it later? How's it different depending on the type of galaxy? And then depending on the types of galaxy, because galaxies can be the same size as the Milky Way, or they can be 10, 100 times more massive, or 10 or 100 or 1,000 times less massive than the Milky Way. And so what is it that governs, why is the Milky Way the size it is, and versus um, some galaxies that are more massive and some that are less. And so that's how, how they build up their, their mass over time, because they didn't just form as one giant you know, galaxy. Uh, so this is this picture of what we call hierarchical formation, which is essentially early on, you have small little galaxies, which we call the building blocks, and then they merge to form bigger and bigger galaxies. And in that process, they could form lots of new stars that then of course make the oxygen and the iron that you and I are very, very um, uh, reliant on, you know, mm -hmm. uh, oxygen to breathe, the iron that's coursing through our blood. Um, and so how does that connect with the actual growth of the galaxies themselves? So that's it, essentially what I try to do is piece this information together. Wow. So it's very, very complex and having to look into, you know, billions of back, back in time, billions of years. So yeah, it's for, great though. Yeah. For, for our viewers who don't know much about redshift and the Z parameter in astronomy, mm -hmm. It basically stands for a redshift parameter and it's the observed wavelength of a spectral line minus the length of the line it would have if its source was not in motion. This leads us to a conversation about deep observational surveys that track how galaxies assemble, assemble over cosmic time. So what are Z-Forge and Mosel? So the other thing about astronomers is we love our acronyms. <laughs> we yeah. love making up names with, and I think this is, I think, fairly standard for any field. But so the ZForge and Mosul are two surveys that I've helped develop. And so ZForge, what it does is it, 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 
it takes images of the universe at different wavelengths. So basically at, with different colors. Um, but the thing about Z-Forge is it wasn't just working in the optical, it was really pushing to the near infrared. So I think everybody oh, okay. here is familiar with the idea that optical wavelengths are what our eyes are used to. And then if you go to like the um, mid infrared, you can see things, things in the dark, right? Cause you can detect infrared radiation from, from body heat. Um, and so the, the that, so the near infrared is a, are wavelengths that are a little bit longer than optical, but um, the great thing is that if we can still track most of the stellar mass in galaxies if we go into the near infrared. And the advantage is that with redshift, as it implies, if you move galaxies, or sorry, if galaxies are farther and farther away, they, their light gets redshifted. And so a galaxy that, that if it was nearby would be really nice and bright in the optical. Now, if, you, if I put it at a redshift of say two, when the universe was only about 3 billion years old, then that most of its light is no longer in the optical. Most of that light is actually now in the near infrared because it's red shifted. And so Z-Forge really um, was able to utilize that by looking at the universe now in the near infrared and building up a sample of 70,000 objects and find in tracking how those galaxies, um, where they are relative to us um, in terms of distance. And so that was the great thing about Z-Forge is that we could really, um, by combining these different filters or colors essentially, uh, we could figure out approximately where the galaxies are relative to us and then essentially kind of do a 3D map of the universe, a very fuzzy oh. 3D map, but it's essentially a 3D map of the universe. And it, uh, that 3D map, instead of being just the local neighborhood was really far allowed us to push to much larger distances. And so we could track how galaxies were distributed out to a much larger distance from us. And so that was great, the great thing about Z-Forge. And then Mosul really is um, essentially a, a part of Z-Forge. And Mosul really focuses on the galaxies that are the most distant. So we have this nice 3D map. And so if you, if you look at the 3D map through cosmic time, you can put together that photo album. But then what Mosul does is that Mosul concentrates really on the baby pictures, really trying to uh. look at the galaxies that are really far away and then trying to piece together the information that we have um, in terms of the multi-wavelength observations to, to look at the building blocks in a little bit more detail so that we can see how they then um, combined to form galaxies like the Milky Way. Does that does that hopefully give you a sense of how yeah. those two surveys? Yeah. So they pretty much work work together, de detecting like the VAR, like the close range and oh, not range, it's time and further in time. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. So the next question, a lot of aerospace engineers want to develop equipment to aid space discovery. What do astrophysics, uh, astrophysicists such as yourself want us to work on or further develop? Could the telescopes be further improved? Uh, what do you as an astrophysicist want to see more in development? Well, obviously aerospace engineering is incredibly critical. <laughs> <laughs> for the science I do, because we, we um, I use a lot of the telescopes in space. And so essentially my, my basic answer, which I think um, is really key here, is that anytime there's new technology that's developed, it opens up a new window into the universe. So it allows us to make discoveries that we never even knew were possible. And so my perspective on that is that just work on interesting technology, try to push that envelope. And then it, when you enable um, technology, you also enable the science. And so mm -hmm. a lot, so, so that really is an, it, really critical. So for example, you know, with Hubble, that was obviously a total game changer because we could see the universe in much higher resolution because we got above the atmosphere because the atmosphere of the earth makes everything a little blurry. So as soon as you sent telescopes above the atmosphere, you could actually see things much more um, sharply. And now with JWST, which hopefully will be launched, knock on wood, should be launched later this <laughs> year. Now you have that clarity, but it's now we're pushing into longer wavelengths, just like what I was saying earlier about Z-Forge pushing into the near infrared. 
JWST also pushes to longer wavelengths, and it also has a different um, capabilities in terms of the instruments that are on board. So there are um, these spectrographs that allow us to take uh, spectra of pretty much every single object in the field over, a set, over, over, uh, over these wavelength ranges that are much um, out to longer wavelengths. And so that reveals a lot more information than we're currently able to do with even Hubble and ground-based telescopes. So I guess the basic question, the basic answer is that if you, if you open up a new wavelength range for us, if you open up a new resolution capability, if you open up new spectroscopic capabilities, basically if you open up any, any types of new capabilities, astronomers will figure out how to utilize it and, and look at the universe in different ways. So a lot, a lot, a lot to be done if you wanna get further into discovering uh, the, the birth of the universe, I guess. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And next question, one of the things that fascinates everyone is dark matter. What exactly is it and what can it tell us about our universe? So dark matter is everywhere, but we can't actually directly observe it. At least it doesn't seem to emit any radiation that we can detect. Mm -hmm. That's why we call it dark. Um, but we see its imprint in terms of the gravity. Um, and so if you think of mass, right? So, you, so mass, it doesn't necessarily have to shine, right? So you can have a light bulb that shines um, and it has some mass, but you can also have a brick True. <laughs> that has a lot more mass and it doesn't shine, right? Um, so, so, so if you think about dark matter, it, it essentially for, it is, um, makes up at least currently the bulk of mass in the universe, but we can't detect it directly. We can only detect how it impacts the movement of objects that are, are um, in the system. So for example, when I look at galaxies, I know that there is, I directly actually measure the fact that there's tons of dark matter in these systems. Um, mm -hmm. And it's because of the way how, how the stars and the gas move. So it's essentially assuming you're in what's called, you know, gravitational equilibrium, I mean, so this is a fancy word for basically saying everything is you know, stable. So <laughs> gravitational equilibrium is the earth going around the sun. It's been doing that for a while and it's gonna keep on doing that. So that's fine. Um, and so if you look at a galaxy, gravitational equilibrium simply means that the, the, you know, the mass that's there isn't changing substantially, at least in the snapshot that we have. And everything is, quote, is normally stable. Um, so that's why you have things like nice spiral arms, for example, if you're looking at a, a spiral galaxy. Uh, but how fast those objects are moving tells me that there has to be a lot more mass there because you have the gravitational potential and the kinetic um, energy, and those have to um, be balanced. That's what we mean by gravitational equilibrium. And so the, the, the speed of the stars that we measure and the gas that we measure is much higher than if it was just the 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 light that we see from the stars, the, mm. the light that we actually able to collect. And so we know that there has to be a lot of mass there. And so one of the big um, you know, uh, uh, goals for things like the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland uh, in, 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 at CERN is to find dark matter candidates. And it's possible that these things just have, you, we, we haven't been able to probe a certain region of temperature, density, and velocity, et cetera, that, um, that would correspond to a dark matter candidate. Um, so the way I think of it, I know it's kind of abstract, but let's say we're in a room, we're very comfortable here, yes, you know, relatively. Yeah. <laughs> but you would never, if you look around, you're never gonna see ice. Ice, ice isn't gonna, no. yeah, 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 right. I mean, but th there's water. I mean, you know, there's water you, as a liquid. People are mostly made of water. There's water in the air in terms of humidity, mm. but you're not gonna see ice, right? Because it's a, it's the temperature and density of the room is such that ice cannot exist. Now, on a very cold day, maybe not in Sydney, but maybe over in the Blue Mountains, right? Mm. If you lower the temperature enough the water vapor in the air solidifies and then it becomes ice and snow. Um, and so you have now the possibility to see water in this different phase. And so one question is that maybe the universe as we, it is now, it's just, we aren't um, able to, you know, we don't have the conditions 
that are necessary to directly observe a dark matter particle, but you can try to recreate those con conditions in a particle accelerator, like the ones that um, the uh -huh. LHC and CERN. And so you have to create the conditions that are, uh, and when you create new conditions, uh, it's a higher density, or sorry, certainly higher temperature, higher velocities, higher um, uh, density, then you can open up a new field of, of, of trying to look at the universe. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, so yeah, that's, so you pretty much have to change your conditions in order to try exactly. and find this, this dark matter. And by dark matter candidate, is, is that you mean like a certain condition or a certain like, like, well, yeah, what do you mean so, by candidate? So, so, <laughs> so this is not my field of expertise, um, but it could be neutrinos or one type of neutrino, for example, because oh, yeah. um, there's way more neutrinos than there are any other particle in the universe. And so even if neutrinos have just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of mass, that would certainly be sufficient for um, you know, making up the, the dark matter that we observe. Oh, but there's a range gosh. of, yeah, there's, a, there's just a range of um, uh, what we consider parameter space or discovery space. And so these particle um, colliders like the LHCs are really trying to um, make the conditions that will allow uh, the physicists to determine exactly, for example, what the cross section of a dark matter particle would be. Um, yeah, things like that. <laughs> wow. Well, so now on the next question, in 2017, you and Professor Carl Glazebrook spotted a massive inactive galaxy when the universe was only 1.65 billion years old only. <laughs> how, how did your team achieve this and how did it change people's understanding of the universe? So that this goes back to ZForge. As I mentioned, ZForge did this very coarse 3D mapping of the universe out from nearby to much, much larger distances. And that larger distance corresponded to looking back in time. And so we found these very rare objects um, that seem to be very massive, much more massive than the Milky Way, but not forming stars. So our, our Milky Way is a galaxy that forms, is forming stars, about one new star every year. Um, and, and so Early on in the universe, we think that pretty much all galaxies are going off like fireworks because they have to make all the stars that we see today. Um, and so when the universe was this young, you know, 1.65 billion years old, we expect this to be essentially that huge growth period when galaxies are, are converting a lot of their gas into new stars. And so seeing a galaxy that isn't doing that is really weird. Yeah. <laughs> right? So it's, 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 it, you know, why is this one galaxy, which is already very massive, unlike pretty much every, virtually 99.9% .9 of the other galaxies in the universe at that time, why is it not forming new stars? And so that's why it really challenged our understanding of how galaxies form. Because first of all, why was there a galaxy at, at this very early stage in the universe that wasn't forming stars? And then secondly, how did it get this massive by so early, it, it was a monster already when the universe was really young. And so there's something that allowed it to form very early and er form very quickly, like basically um, you know, have yeah, a huge growth spurt and then completely shut down. And that's not a condition that, like I said, 99.9% .9 of galaxies in the universe don't do that. And so what made this object you know, what were the conditions that allowed this object to form in that way? And then, you know, what, what does that tell us about how, how galaxies in general are able to um, essentially regulate how they form their stars? Uh, and, and that's the only type of galaxy that's been found? Like that, that's the only one in, that's inactive? So far, I think there was um, one other group that found another, uh, what we call these inactive or quiescent galaxies. But this is, once again, we're, we're talking about we had 70,000 objects and we, and we had maybe 10 candidates. Right? So talk about a needle in a haystack. Yeah, jeez. Right? That's, that's difficult. Right. Oh my. right. So that's, that's why, you know, we had to sift through this piles and piles of galaxies, many of which were extremely interesting. But because we had such 
collected such a large, you know, was able, were able to survey such a large volume of the universe to such a large distance, we were able to find these needle in this in the haystack, um, and then and then go in and, and try to study them in more detail. Yeah. Okay, so I guess a bit of, a bit of a tangent then with I guess uh, trying to sift through data and analyzing you know the seventy seven thousand galaxies. What kind of software or is there any contribution of machine learning or AI in this oh, field of absolutely astronomy? absolutely <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, now that we, we're, we're in, a, in a great position where we have data sets with not just a handful of objects, right, but, but tens of thousands of galaxies or, or stars. I mean, the, the Gaia satellite has now uh, mapped most of the stars in the Milky Way. So cool. billions of stars, right? So somebody has, you know, not one person, but some, some algorithm has to go through and actually identify the stars and figure out what types they are. And the same thing with galaxies. So for example, one project that I'm working on right now, actually also with uh, Carl Glazebrook, is uh, based on convolutional neural networks and sifting through these massive imaging data sets um, to identify the handful of objects that look like they're, they could um, be gravitational lenses. So gravitational lenses are exactly, it's essentially exactly what it sounds <laughs> like. What you have is a, is a massive object and then it lenses the light and the object behind it, and this has to do with general relativity, but it's a cool, it's it's one of the coolest things in the universe. I mean, there are many amazing things in the universe, but gravitational lensing is definitely up there. Mm -hmm. And so what it does is it allows us to measure the mass of the, the, the galaxy um, directly, because essentially the, the light, how the light is bent, it corresponds directly to how much mass is in that galaxy. And so, um, yeah, I, I, a few years ago, my team and I also discovered the most distant gravitational lens and it still holds the record for the farthest gravitational cool. lens that we know of, yeah. And we can use this to weigh the galaxy directly, um, to measure its mass directly. Um, and so, you, and you can also use this in the same way that you can imagine a magnifying glass helps you see the objects behind it more. The gravitational lens is also the light in, that um, is coming from the background object also gets magnified. And so you can look at the galaxy behind it um, in more detail. And so these are really in, these amazing tools to study the universe, um, in particular, pushing uh, our ability to resolve, in, in other words, see things in high definition, both in terms of how faint they are, but then also in terms of spatial scales, in terms of mapping. And so trying to, get the, the thing about gravitational lensing, it has a very distinctive signature. It's a visual, mm. it's a visual tag. Um, if you if you see them, it's it's actually fair, like once, once you train a neural network, right? If you can train oh, a neural yeah, network yeah. on a set, it you can then say, okay, exactly. Mm. And then now instead of having to go by eye through all of these imaging data sets, you train your neural network and then the neural network goes and identifies um, all of these candidates. And so right now we have a list of about 2000 candidates and we're doing follow-up observations of these, these um, gravitational lenses. And that's really exciting. So yes, absolutely um, machine learning, uh, data science, these are all things that are really uh, important tools to an astronomer um, and, and, it's, and having, that's part of what we, we train our, um, our students in, and a lot of our students are in, in, who get trained in astrophysics actually go into data science. Um, and they, they have amazing careers um, working on a range of topics, anywhere from finance to studying how malaria is spread so that um, it, obviously you can try to develop uh, mm -hmm. strategies to, to mitigate that, um, global health and um, just, just being able to work with large data sets and analyze them in a way that um, to pick out the, the information that is needed uh, is, is really a skill that we develop as part of our training in, in astrophysics. Wow, like a jack of all trades with the data science. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. Uh, next question. So scientific missions delivered by space agency have paved the way to what we know about space today. Missions like Voyager for deep space have found valuable information about our solar system. 
and beyond, while Earth observation satellites such as Invisisat have provided long-term temperature trends confirming global warming. These pioneering missions have led to innumerable discoveries and set a high technical standard for space instruments. But we see that a lot of private companies and investors such as SpaceX's um, Starlink are now shifting their focus into space releasing these satellites, which are obstructing observational astronomy research and observations and observations of how our universe will be near impossible this keeps going on. Could you please delve deeper on the importance of our jobs as astronomers? Why do we need to study the universe so much? And why do you do what you do? <laughs> so, I mean, I think the, the, the question that has always been in anyone's mind as soon as they look up is what our place is in the universe. You know, how, you know, wh how, how do we fit into this celestial space? And that's something that it doesn't matter what language you speak where you were born, where you live, um, you always have this wonder because as soon as you mm. look up, you realize that there is more to your world than just the, the what's around you. And so I think looking at the universe forces us, not forces us, but invites us as human beings to ask big questions, right? to ask how the world works how the universe works. Um, and as a result, we learn so much more and our lives are richer for it. And I think in terms of, I mean, I'll give you one example, which may seem sort of obscure until you realize how important it is. So um, almost and now a little bit over a hundred years ago, um, Albert Einstein predicted that uh, I would not pretty, developed the theory of general relativity, which at the time seemed, well, okay, that's nice. It, it essentially solves a lot of you know, theoretical questions about how um, mass and, and gravity, et cetera, work. But day to day, general relativity has no impact on lives, at least back in the early 1900s. Um, but he made this prediction and the uh, way, way they could test it was in 1919, there was actually a uh, solar eclipse. And so what that means is that the sun is mass. And so if there was a way to block out the light from the sun, you could see this lensing signal by, by because essentially there's a mirage that happens. The stars behind the sun get shifted a bit in position. And of course, mm -hmm. now the sun is so bright that you can't see it unless there's something to block out the light from the sun. In other words, the moon. And so he predicted, in 19, and, and this was tested in 1919 during the, um, the eclipse, and essentially showed that general relativity is true. And that was, you know, celebrated, but at some level, people were like, well, okay, what is, you know, that doesn't change how I do anything. Except that if we didn't know about general relativity, satellites, obviously, would not be working properly, right? Because the thing about general relativity is it applies to all masses and that includes the earth. So the earth also has a mass. And so um, in this idea that there's both special relativity and general relativity, these are effects that you have to take into account when you're, for example, synchronizing clocks on, on global positioning satellites. Yeah. Because if you don't take into account these corrections, you will basically um, accrue an average er error of 10 kilometers a day, a day. right? Yeah, so, so, so I mean, so the fact, I mean, obviously your phone and our computers all rely on, on, on understanding a whole ranges of physics um, that are not evident in our everyday lives. Now, in terms of, you know, with the satellites, it is actually an extremely um, huge concern right now. In fact, the um, IAU, the International Astronomical Union, uh, is the largest professional society of astronomers. There's actually now a division um, and an effort to talk about how uh, we can manage the fact that there are more and more satellites going up into space and that it's not being in any way uh, it's just a wild, wild west. And the problem is that these satellites are now interfering, will interfere, already are interfering, and will continue to interfere in our observations. So when we're looking at things in the universe that are really, really faint, 
you think, well, a satellite, how bright can it be? It, it's, you can see it with your naked eye, right? Like if, you, if you've ever gone out at night, you can see satellites passing overhead because they reflect light from the sun. Oh, and so you can, and so, yeah, yeah, exactly. Gosh. So now, yeah. <laughs> so depending how big the satellites are, you know, they, if, if you can imagine objects that, I mean, um, they don't even have to be as, as, uh, as bright as, as the stars that you can see with your eye, because the stuff we look at is a million times fainter than the stars that you see in the sky. And that's the stuff I look at anyway. And so point. having... Uh... Yeah. So imagine now trying to, you know, trying to, to take um, a picture, rather, rather trying to measure the light from a, you know, a, a candle, and now ha being in a room that is filled with, you know, torches. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 a real problem and and so that that essentially blinds us to being able to look out beyond our atmosphere as soon as we have this essentially halo of satellites that are um, coming and going and 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 you, can, you know they will interfere with our observations because they will reflect light and as soon as you get any any of that any light from um, those satellites yeah it, it, it comp so we, we need to find a solution to this because it needs to be governed or regulated somehow um, such that it doesn't interfere with the observations of the universe because if we're blind to the universe, then how do we, how do we search for the answers to the biggest questions if we can't mm. see beyond our, our atmosphere? Uh, that's that's what, what, what exactly can astronomers like you said you have your committee or, or count astronomers council what mm -hmm. exactly can they do to I guess I guess fight back against um all these all these companies well I think that it has to be um there had just has to be continued raise, raising awareness um mm -hmm. and that they're internationally governments need to come together and um, issue some type of procedure or regulation or, um, you know, basically, for example, I, when I lived in Switzerland, um, <laughs> one of the things I thought was brilliant was that um, if, if, you, if, you know, with appliances and, and things like that, um, you basically, uh, if, you, if you bought something that um, couldn't, couldn't be recycled, then you had to pay a fee um, but then you could get some of that back if you brought it to to a place that could recycle at least the parts. Mm -hmm. And so you're you're paying you're essentially paying it forward to some extent. And so one other, or for example, in in certain places, um, for example, on the top in Mauna Kea in Hawaii, they they have um, they we are not allowed to add any new telescopes to the mountain. So if we want to build a new telescope, we have to take a telescope down. Ooh. And, and so it, 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 it allow, it, it forces the, whoever wants to, you know, build a telescope or put satellites in space if, to really not just go and continue, you know, throwing space junk up. Mm. I mean, it's, it's usable for, well, maybe a few years, a decade, maybe longer. But then what happens is you leave it up there. And right now, basically NASA, as well as um, other uh, European Space Agency, et cetera, they have to monitor at, at, um, the space junk. So anything bigger than basically your fist, they have to keep track of because it, if it hits another, um, well, you know, you wouldn't want it to hit any spacecraft, that's mm. for sure. Um, and it's, yeah, so we're you know, in the same way that I don't think, I don't think it was a good idea or people finally realized that it wasn't a good idea to pollute the rivers and the lakes, right? Mm -hmm. Back in the industrial res revolution, they just kept, you know, using whatever waste and, and just having, putting it in the, and dumping it in the rivers and the lakes, et cetera. Um, and then realizing actually, oh, well, this, this has a huge impact on uh, not just the wildlife, but our ability to, to you know, live in this area. Um, and then going and getting some sort of regulations and policies in, in place that allows people to still 
have satellites, but then to make sure that we aren't proliferating um, all of the materials that are now accumulating up in, in, the, in the upper atmosphere. And I mean, this is really important. So for example, if, if we really are serious about space travel, I mean, oh, how yeah. would you feel if you were gonna go up and basically, you know, if, if you remember Star Wars, right? The, the asteroid field that the Millennium Falcon has oh, to fly yeah. through. Yeah. I mean, yes, this is actually worse because at least those asteroids are big enough that you could see them. But imagine basically having a rock flying at you at 500 kilometers a second. Oh gosh. Right, and, and, oh. and now we're proliferating this in the upper atmosphere. So that mm. has to do more largely with all the stuff that's getting sent up into space, but that is related to all these satellites as well, because there is no, as far as I know, there's no plan to recover them. Right? Mm. People say, oh, well, those just fall into the ocean. Well, there's a lot of stuff that could happen before they fall into the ocean. Yeah. And to be fair, you know, yeah, seven tenths of the earth is covered in water, but there's three tenths that isn't. And I would imagine that that's also for the people who are living on land, like you and me, maybe you know, aren't fully comfortable with the prospect of having more and more space debris potentially falling off. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't be keen on seeing a satellite just dump in my backyard or in my bedroom. And, yeah. And yeah, even with like, I think Envisasat, they, it, they commissioned like in 2012 and then like for our viewers at home, the this this satellite, uh, I believe it's it it lasted five extra years um, doing you know its its observations. But then, uh, according to its orbital trajectory, it's just going to be stuck in there for 150 years before ever coming back down. So, yeah, space junk and space debris definitely needs to be addressed in the in the near future. Yeah. And so, I mean, there's the immediate effect, which is that the satellites are going to certainly affect our observations of the dark sky, but then the long-term effect, which is that, is how are these things going to be decommissioned? And, then, and if the companies that are sending them up are, you know, they should be responsible for it, but I suspect that at this point, there's no policy that mm. is, is um, you know, that is where that is being enforced. So imagine essentially if you wanted to fly when, when, when we are allowed to get on airplanes again, but if you wanted to fly and every time you flew, you had to go basically through, you know, a flock of birds. How would you feel oh, <laughs> about yeah. the safety of that it's situation? Yeah. Oh, wow. Something a bit more lighthearted. Uh, what's, what's <laughs> the most rewarding part of your work? So I really love working with um, people and helping my students and my team members um, you know, work on really interesting problems and also uh, build confidence that they have the ability to really tackle the hard questions. Because I think um, for me, being in university allows me to work with students and that's really rewarding. Um, I mean, obviously teaching classes, but then also um, when they join the team to work on research as part of their undergraduate experience, uh, that's, that's a really rewarding part. And, and just being able to think about the questions that I want to think about, right? I have a lot of freedom in that sense. Like, what are the problems? What's the, what, where the, mm. you know, I get to study galaxies. I, yeah, I, yeah. Well, maybe I want to study gravitational lenses and, and that's essentially where I'm going now, but it's still galaxies, but now it's a slightly new direction or different direction. Um, and so it's always interesting. There's, it's, it's never boring. Certainly that's never boring. I wish sometimes it was a little bit more boring because usually there's like way too much to do. Um, so I think for me, that's, that's, that's really what I enjoy about what I do is just that I get to think about interesting questions, work with fantastic people and um, really, really push that, that observation, the envelope in terms of discovering new things about our universe. Yeah, wow. Good to hear, especially, yeah, if, if it's I know like some of some of our students you know str str uh, struggling through uni just mm. and they're not really sure where where to go but if you if you're always busy doing doing what you do then it's it's a good a good sign you're in the field you like and next question um 
you've been around around the whole world for your research. What were some valuable life lessons that you may have learned doing so? Um, so when we're able to travel again, travel. <laughs> um, <laughs> And okay. not only travel, but also use the opportunity to work in different countries and different cultures, if at all possible, because um, nowadays it's, it's very global. So you know, members of my team are from Australia, from the US, from India, from Europe, um, and everybody comes with a different perspective and it's really valuable. And so I think it's really important to be able to see um, to attack problems from different uh, angles and having uh, those different perspectives. Uh, so I think that's really valuable. And honestly, just learning more about other cultures for me is, 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 is so much fun. I mean, I love food. So trying foods from different places and um, it, you know, being able to experience um, cultures, be, as, as you travel so as if you like the thing about well once again when we're able to travel again so as an astronomer you do tend to travel quite a lot so either uh certainly for conferences and um, visiting collaborators but also for giving talks if you've been invited to give talks at um different universities and then um, if you use telescopes you often go to the telescopes as well to uh, use them and so there's this opportunity to learn so much more about the world we live in um, while you're trying to understand our place in the universe. And so, I, yeah, that's, that's for me, a, been a real highlight of what I do is, is just being able to, to see the world and, and understand that um, I, being able to solve problems is, is, is one aspect that's really important is having different perspectives and different people looking at the problem in different ways. Wow. And another question, uh, what advice do you have for students who want to pursue, pursue a similar pathway in astronomy? So I would say, um, I mean, basically try to find, so we have an astronomy program um, at the UNSW in the School of Physics and um, just get involved in research, even if it's just a couple hours a, a week where you're essentially shadowing a research team and sitting in on their um, weekly meetings so that you can learn a little bit more about the terminology and the types of questions that they're uh, trying to solve. Uh, I think that's really important because then I'll give you a sense of that, whether or not you're interested in you know, maybe observational astrophysics or what you would probably consider experimental or maybe theory side or building instruments, which is really important for what we do. Um, and it just gives you a better sense of what it is you like and what you don't like. And so oh. I've worked with a number of students. I know that many of my colleagues work with students every year. Um, and I think obviously doing the classwork, getting that strong background in you know, physics and maths is, is critical. Um, but in the end, I think you don't know what you like until you try it. And so I always just really? recommend people, you know, just try, you know, try it for a term. It's, it's not like you, it's a life commitment. You know, try working with this team or this project for a, a, you know, a one term. And if you like it, you can continue. And if you don't, you can try something else. But until you until you try it out, you just, you're just not gonna know. So that would be my, my advice is just to um, you know, obviously balance the, the schoolwork with your other responsibilities, but whenever possible, try to get some type of research experience so that you know whether or not this is something that you like. And then secondly, what particular maybe field of astrophysics you, you would really like to explore more. Yeah. Okay, now moving on to the questions from students. Uh, we have a few here. So first one is, uh, is there a possibility of multiple universes? Uh, the multiverse, that is one, <laughs> a one theoretical model. Um, and so that, sure, why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> <laughs> that's, 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 not my, that's not my area of, of expertise. Um, but I mean, essentially, as an observational astronomer, I'm only able to see what we call our Hubble volume, and that's essentially the age of the universe times the speed of light. And so um, that the sphere, that's this Hubble volume, which is essentially centered on the 
by definition on the earth, that's 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 the, the observable universe that I can see. Um, and well, not just me, but every astronomer, every astrophysicist. <laughs> so we don't know what's beyond that. So on a related note, somebody, I remember one of the questions is that, is the universe finite or infinite? And nobody knows because mm -hmm. we can only see part of it. Yeah, we can only see part of it, right? So it's, it's like a, a string. You don't know how long the string is if you can only see if you're it, part of it. So we wow. don't know. <laughs> uh, hard, hard, hard question, hard answers. Yeah, um, it's back to back to uh, before about space debris. Uh, someone's asked, "What can we do as engineers about space debris?" Oh, work on it, please. On it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why I'm in. I mean, I don't know what I, I, I don't have it in my brain how to solve this problem, but hopefully, um, one of the, the listeners um, will be part of the solution because. You know, people talk about, well, maybe we can catch the space debris. And the analogy is, have you tried to catch a bullet with a butterfly net? I mean, these <laughs> things are in orbit, right? They're, they're, they're in orbit. So they're going at thousands of kilometers a second. So basically, how, how do you catch these things and collect them in a way, uh, because it's only going to get worse. And it is a huge problem. I don't think people, and, and I mean, if you want to just think of it in a, in a just a daily, daily basis, all the satellites that we use for our phones, for our GPS, for uh, streaming, et cetera, um, all of those are in space. And basically the more space junk there is out there, the more encounters um, those satellites or the, the things that we actually really do rely on working all the time get dinged and um mm. yeah so it's so those things eventually are, are gonna uh will will certainly be impacted literally by space debris and so we we really it's a huge problem it's and it's only in it so i'm really hoping that there's a cohort of people out there who i mean i know there are people working on it but um but yeah, we, we really need to solve it somehow. And this is why, you know, as I said, related to all the satellites that are getting spent up, sent up. I mean, I don't know what the decommissioning um, policies are for these other than just to, well, space is big and these things are small. That's not really an answer. Yeah, it's, it's getting worse and worse as, as, as we know. Uh, next question. What is the next big thing in the field of astronomy? Oh, uh, well, certainly the... JWST, which is the next telescope that's going to be launched later this year, is going to open in terms of resolution and wavelengths, completely different, you know, discovery space for us as, as astronomers and, and trying to understand the universe. Um, there is just next generation observatories. There's things called adaptive optics, which allows us to observe from the ground with higher um, resolution so that we don't have to necessarily send um, as many telescopes into space so that we can get above the atmosphere. Uh, there's, so I'm just thinking more like aerospace stuff. There's obviously the satellites. I mean, so I've talked about the satellites that are problematic. I mean, obviously satellites themselves are, are not, they, they exist. So, so mm -hmm. the question is how do we use them? So astronomers are also using these CubeSats to um, send up, missions to observe the universe. Um, and so that's really exciting as well. So that's also an opportunity for astronomers. The difference is that we, you know, as astronomers, we may launch one a year, whereas these other oh. companies are launching, right? Hundreds of them per year. Yeah. So it's, it's a very different scale. Um, and so I would just say, in yeah, we know, we know, we've learned so much about the universe, but as with everything, the more you learn, the less you know. <laughs> That makes sense. Yeah, exactly. The, it's once you start figuring out things that might be or could be, then there's even more and more questions than you had at the start. So it's a right. Uh, I mean, I definitely think the question earlier about dark matter that's critical. I mean, oh, yeah. I think everyone should be mildly disturbed that we don't know what 75% of the mass in the universe is. <laughs> um, and then dark energy, of course, I mean, we still don't really know what's driving that. Um, so these types of models in terms of, you know, the universe is a, cos a cosmological model. These are all really uh, critical. Yeah. 
Uh, uh, as an academic, how do you keep your mental to stay on top of all your work and how to deal with burnout? Well, I think it's really important. So mental health and mental um, wellness, I think are so important. So this is actually something I'm very much involved in um, with trying to be advocates for recognizing that we have to have a work-life balance and um, you know, taking time off. I really you know, tell my team, I'm like, look, you, you can't, I mean, yes, there are times when there are deadlines, like preparing for an exam or finishing up a project, right? We always have those deadlines, yeah. but I think you have to, you have to take time off. Um, you know, time, not time, not, I shouldn't call it time off. It says time for yourself, which is just as important. And so that can be some sort of hobby or some sort of, um, you know, uh, activity that you do by yourself or with other people. Um, I think that's really important. So I love to cook. So, uh, you know, I, I'll spend oh. like, you know, a whole day just making jam or cakes or, you know, making a stew. And, and I, I yeah. try to catch up, you know, even though now we're not, we don't, aren't able to travel. So what I do is I just, because we have video calls like this. So I call my friends or my family and we just chat you know, virtually while we're cooking. I, I, you know, have a baking Zoom with my friends. Um, wow. And uh, I also, um, I'm very active, so go walking, I garden. Um, and these are all time away. And the way I, 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 my way I try to say is that, you know, what we do is even though we're not physically active, it is a lot of um, energy in our brain. And so it's important to allow the brain to recharge. And in the same way that, you know, you, you, um, you, you sort of can imagine having a fuel tank and, um, you know, you use it, you use it, but then at some point you have to pause and let it get full again so that you're ready for that next challenge. And it also makes you enjoy what you do more and enjoy life more in general. And that brings a lot of value to, to that, to what, what, when you're working on a project. So I, I think mental health and, and mental wellness uh, are really important. And um, I think that if, if people feel like it's, you know, they need some help with that, to, it's really important to get a support group, uh, either through medical professionals or, and or um, family and friends, you know, all of the above uh, for me. <laughs> it, but it's, it's really important because we do push ourselves very hard to um, you know, study the universe and to, to be, um, I could be you know, rigorous in our research. And so it's really important to balance that out with time to recharge and to take a breather so that you can go back with, with um, energy to tackle yeah. those big problems. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of, a lot of our, our students say AA need to hear that just because, you know, once you're, if you're stuck into the term, it's about 10 mm -hmm. weeks of just going hard out at completing assessments and assignments. Some people, yeah find it hard to not do work because they, they feel like they'll, you know, lose some time here and there, but. Yeah. No, I mean, the way, I, so here's, here's my analogy, which is that, would you want to run a marathon every day? Oh, heck no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. And so even if you're an Olympic athlete, you are not going to run a marathon every day. And the marathon is very physical. And you think, okay, well, that's oh, fine. But I'm, all I'm doing is, you know, classwork or research projects. Or I'm like, those are the equivalent because you're still very in, highly focused and intensely working. And it's intellectual. And just because you're not, you know, <laughs> covering large distances physically doesn't mean that yeah. you're not still expending the same type of mental um, energy and reserves. So in the same way that I don't think you would expect anyone to run a marathon every day, 365 days out of the year. Um, I don't think that we, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to work hard, you have to, you also have to rest so that you are able, especially if you know you have a big event coming up, like either project deadline or, um, you know, exams and assessments, et cetera, you have to take that time to build up that reservoir. I think it's, it's just really, really critical. Yeah. Yeah. Good to hear. And I guess one last question for myself is um, with this new James Webb telescope going up, uh, I guess what's the, 
like with with you know there's millions of scientists across the globe how is it like a turn-taking process for you know who gets uh, to use a telescope oh it's my turn or <laughs> something like that oh uh, no it's highly competitive and i know because i was part of the actual review process for it so what happens is that there's a call um, for proposals and so people put in their ideas and then they have to learn about how the instruments would work and so they say well you know if i i want to observe this object and i need to be able to detect um, this amount of light then with this instrument it will take one hour um, and so i'm requesting that time to observe this object and obtain the data i need to um, answer this question that i have and so these proposals go in and they're reviewed by, um, it's called peer review, so other astronomers like myself, and the over-description rate was about a factor of five. So for every five proposals that go oh. through, one is actually accepted. That's not oh, even man. that bad, actually. Because <laughs> in other, so it, it depends. Sometimes it's as high as 10. So for every 10 proposals that go through, one actually gets accepted. But it's, you know, your, your, your science is being reviewed by people who are active in the field and can evaluate um, whether or not the question you're asking is, um, it, it can be answered with the data that you've, you've requested and um, you know, relative to other questions that people want to answer, how that is um, relative, you know, where that is in the field. Um, so it's, it's a whole range of, um, very rigorous, both in terms of preparing observer uh, pr um, proposals, but then also reviewing them and then assessing which ones should go up and which ones maybe need a little bit more work such that they can have a tighter science case or a clearer um, observational design such that they, they can be um, you know, put in again in the next round and hopefully are successful. Yeah. That's uh, sounds like a very, very uh, complex process just to try and get your your message or your question across but yeah we'll hope to see it you know go goes up well and gets mm -hmm. utilized well to find new new and bigger things yeah i mean basically if you think about everything you, I mean, the hubble has brought us um in terms of discoveries from planets all the way out to the first galaxies so that whole discovery space was enabled by by hubble so now we're looking at the, the successor, which is the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST. And when people ask me, well, you know, what are you, what are you going to discover? And I was like, well, if I knew, it wouldn't be a discovery. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll find out. Yeah. You know, we launch it and we have a bunch of questions we know we want to look into. And the best part is finding out stuff that you didn't, didn't expect to be there. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, yeah, thank you. So from everyone at AIAA, thank you so much, Professor Tran, for having us on our first episode of the 2021 AIAA speaker series. We have learned, oh, I've definitely learned so much about astronomy <laughs> uh, with you, and I'm sure our viewers have too. And Well, it's a real um, honor for um, to be the first speaker of, the, of this year. And uh, as I said, people feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to answer any follow up questions that you guys may have. And um, in particular, as I said, if people want to learn more about astronomy in general, I think that the I mean, obviously taking classes, but then looking into uh, some short research experiences, um, I think is, is really the best way to go. And uh, in particular, there's such a strong representation of aerospace engineering in astrophysics, observational astrophysics, that there's clear uh, opportunities there. Yeah.